Welcome to today's meeting. Um, just to, so that everybody's clear, we have quite a lot of people in the room today. In fact, I'm just going to say we have everybody in the room, um, bar Johnny, who is joining us via Starleaf. Um, I have no apologies for today, uh, which is agenda item number one, other than to say that Robin will be here, but he's going to just be a tiny bit late. So I move on then to agenda item number two, within, which is chairperson's business. Um, I just want to inform members that the vice chair and myself met this morning. Um, we had a meeting to do with the evaluation of the Cliff Edge Coalition. Um, it was a very good meeting, and uh, they basically just wanted to know um, what our views were on the Cliff, Cliff Edge Coalition and how impactful they will be um, to the committee. So that's basically about the height of it. Anything you want to add further to that, Kelly? Or um, I, I just to reiterate that um, during the meeting we, com meeting, we confirmed that that grouping together of organisations yeah. was extremely successful, and it would be good if more could do that with us, because it means we then we're getting. All of us are getting the voices from so many more than if they tried to all come to us individually. Um, then I just want to move on then uh, with further chairperson's business and just inform members that on Monday the 21st of September, the Minister announced the opening of the 1 million COVID-19 safe sports pack fund to help with clubs um, and their safe return into sport. And that will be administered by um, Sport NI. Um, the fund is very welcomed. However, I just want, and I don't want to make a song and dance over it, but I just want to say that the committee weren't informed about this. The minister has been very good in informing us of various decisions. In fact, we got one this week to do with the monuments. Um, but it's just, if I could just um, ask that we just drop a note um, through to the minister or through the DALO to say that um, really we should be informed of that prior to that going out to be made public. Are members in agreement with that? Okay. All right. And then I have another piece, which is just to inform um, members that we've received by email a briefing from NI Human Rights Commission on the Immigration and Social, Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill. Um, you remember that the department briefed the committee last week on the relevant revised legislative consent motion, and the committee were content and agreed to support the LCM in plenary. Um, the, the, the debate um, in the Assembly will be purely on the wording of the LCM to allow Westminster to legislate. Um, the NIHRC appears to have some concern around Clause 5. However, as immigration is an expected matter, the committee input has been focused on the social security coordination aspect of the bill and retaining some input into decision making and scrutiny on this through the LCM. Um, are members content to note that report, or as members want to say anything on that, any comment? Are you content just to note it? Okay, that will do, that's grand. Then we'll move on to agenda item three, which is our draft minutes. You'll find the draft minutes of the 16th of September at page six of your pack. Can I then ask our members to content with the minutes of the 16th of September 2020 as drafted? All agreed? Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay, then I'll move on to agenda item number four, which is matters arising. Uh, members, you've been provided at page 12 with the final copy of the Le Legislative Consent Memorandum on the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill. Um, members were briefed on this, again, as I said, at the meeting of 16th September, when they were content to support the motion, which will be brought to plenary for, de date, or for debate in the coming weeks. Again, any comments are content to note that also? Content to note? Okay, thank you. Alrighty. Um, just to remind members that all of our witnesses are coming in in person today. Um, for all of our uh, uh, briefings, so there might be just a slight delay between briefings because we we'll have to do the, the clean down um, between that, so it's just to say that to members. So we're going to move then straight then to item number five, which is a departmental briefing on the Housing Executive Investment Challenge. Um, you'll find that at page 21 of your packs, and if you just take your ease for a moment till we get everybody seated. Hello. Hello, you are very welcome. We'll let you get your coats off and settled before we start. Sorry. You're all right. Okay, members, can we then welcome to the meeting Paul Bryce, who is Programme Manager for the Social Housing Reform Programme, and Heloise Brown, who is the Rent Project Manager. Paul, are you going to start the briefing? Well, yes. Um, um, 
I was just going to talk you through the three or four page note that we okay, advanced the committee about a week ago. Is that, is that, would that help? Yep, that's perfect. So, yep, um, go ahead. I'm sure you probably want to ask lots of questions, really. Um, so, so this is a briefing on the <clears throat> housing executive investment challenge. Um, I suppose I should say one thing before we, I'm going to lay out the challenge here. And it's a challenge that is uh, supported by an analysis we conducted during 1819, and that had a baseline for all of the financial figures that I'm going to give you uh, here of March 2018. Um, so there's two things about that. So it's necessarily out of date. Mm -hmm. Work will need to update it. And, and so it's all a lot worse than I'm going to currently say it is, and all the figures are going to be a lot bigger. Um, and, but we'll only know those in time. But the second thing is um, I'm not going to be able to sort of detail how the department's going to respond to this analysis yet. That's still something under discussion with the minister. Um, and, you know, that, that's very much up to her. Um, OK, um, I'd quickly go through the plot of this. Um, a really important point to start with, the housing executive is, is a creature of two halves. It's our regional housing authority, and it's um, uh, Northern Ireland's large social landlord, 86,000 homes. Um, the relevance of that is that the investment challenge um, is, a, is a landlord matter. And that um, insofar as it challenge, challenges the current classification of the housing executive, insofar as it takes you into territory potentially of reform, none of that need touch the regional housing authority, which delivers the really important functions around um, administering the housing selection scheme, assessing housing need, and distributing new build. So all I'm going to be talking about today is about the landlord, the other half, and need not touch the regional housing authority. Um, the investment challenge is something identified by a survey that was originally conducted by Savills in the start of 2015. Savills looked at 22,000 of the 86,000 homes. So it's a really extensive survey, in, inside and outside, and I mean physically examined them. Um, the figures have been updated on a desktop basis since then um, by the housing executive. And in March 18, um, those figures were that the housing executive needs 7.1 billion over the next 30 years in order for all of its homes, all 86,000, to be um, uh, <coughs> maintained to what is called the commonly adopted standard. That was a standard derived from uh, the standard of investment typically provided by a social landlord. That requirement is front loaded. Um, there is a backlog, and three billion is required over the first 11 years. Um, the housing executive currently collects about 290 million pounds of rent. From that, it has to service its costs first, its management costs, its debt costs, its corporation tax costs, and typically, when it's done that, it has about 150, 160 million a year to spend on investment. And if you need to spend over three billion in 11 years, you'll appreciate that that's only about half of what you need. Um, so um, it has a significant shortfall against the investment requirement required to hold those homes to a commonly adopted standard. The paper notes the reserves here. I'm, I wasn't gonna dwell on that, but I'm happy to take questions about that afterwards. Um, how have we got to this situation? Um, it's about low rents. The, uh, perhaps the most compelling statistic on this point is that around the year 2000, the housing, as housing executive rent was, was, very similar, was very similar to a rent in Sheffield or in Newcastle, in comparable areas of England, in Yorkshire, Humberside. It is now much lower than those rents it used to track. Um, Rents have been frozen um, since 2015-16. That's because of um, UK government policy and its, its desire to stop AMI costs going up and stop housing benefit going up um, because of social rents. Um, the UK government passed legislation to make England, English landlords reduce their social rents by 1% each year. So it's, it's applied that approach equivalently to, to um, the application of AMI to Northern Ireland. Uh, the housing executive stock is old. So it, it needs more investment, more than, say, our housing association stock. And then these familiar points, um, the housing executive can't borrow. 
it can't borrow because it is um, a central government body covered by central budgeting guidance, um, which is to say it could borrow, but if it did, its borrowing would score in the year that it was taken out in public expenditure terms and would require capital cover in my departments, which would effectively neutralise the point of any borrowing. Um, it owes money, as I've already touched upon, legacy debt. At the moment, uh, the total capital interest outstanding is at just over 300 million and it has an anomalous liability for corporation tax. We can come back to that. And that, that is to do with very similar to the reason why the Education Authority was briefly liable for corporation tax uh, because all of the provisions in legislation that exempt entities from corporation tax are designed for things like councils and our housing executive is unique and so doesn't fit those. Um, I think that's hopefully one we can remedy. Um, so those are all the reasons why so much investment is required. Um, it's important to say that the problem is so big that while if we, for instance, could write off the debt of the housing executive, and if we also at the same time could end the liability for corporation tax, and if indeed we even got a backdated payment from the UK government because of all the corporation tax we'd paid, it would be nowhere near enough to address the housing executive investment challenge. The basic analysis is that challenge is so big it needs a two-part solution, and it's a two-part solution related to the causes. It's pretty intuitive. Because rents have been so low and are the cause of the problem, they are part of the solution. Rents would need to go up. But if rents are to remain affordable and social rents, they couldn't go up enough to address the outstanding requirement you would also need a significant capital injection. So that basic two-part solution, well, I, can't, I can't really get into the details of what policy will be, but the, it's no great secret to say the problem is so big that those two things must be part of the solution, a long-term trajectory of rent increases and a capital injection. Um, bit parts could be played by legacy debt and by corporation tax if such solutions were available. Um, that's why you have commitments in New Decade and you approach to a trajectory of rent increases, well, a trajectory of rents that are affordable both to the tenant and to the landlord, uh, balanced in that respect. <clears throat> and of course, you have the commitment to tackle the housing investment challenge per se in the New Decade, New Approach. Um, so that really is, is, that's the sort of analysis in very broad terms. That's the shape of the problem kind of solution you need in terms of the order of magnitude and the issues involved. That covers what's out here in the paper. I could take questions on, on any of it, really. Grant, Paul, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know certainly um, the corporation tax, whenever we look at that, and we've, we've been talked about it here in committee several times, but I think what I read in your paper there, it's 10 million a year, which is a drop in the ocean. Yeah compared to what um, we actually need. Um, so I'm not even going to ask you, uh, you know, how confident are you we're going to get that, because I suppose that's, uh, that's going to be more of an executive um, proposal and, and an agreement that comes through Westminster. Um, but on the other issue to do with the rents, are the money owing to the Council and Department of Finance, um, how, how likely is that to be you know, wiped in any way? You know, is it a likelihood or is it something pie in the sky? In, um, in, well, I will do my best with that, right? Cause it's a bit <laughs> like the one you weren't going to ask me around. We're not, asking, we're not going to write it down and say, Paul said this is going to happen, so it's going to happen. Well, there are two, I think there are broadly speaking two ways it would be done. It would either be funded by the Northern Ireland just... Executive, um, and you can judge whether the Executive might be able to afford that in, a, in addition to its existing priorities. Um, perhaps more realistically, were it to happen, it would be done with the support of the UK government because it yeah. would recognise that the Northern Ireland executive may not afford to write off that debt. Now, the UK government, the UK government did, prior to 2010, agree to the write-off of, of many of the historic debts of many local authorities in respect of housing because those local authorities were going to reform their housing function. Mm -hmm. So it was in the context of a reform package. So that pre-2010 government 
it, it does have precedent there in the context of reform. Um, I don't think there's a precedent of any kind since 2010. I, think that, I don't think there is. Actually, in fact, that there may have been near things that prove the point, i.e. they were eventually rejected. Do you know what the percentage is to councils and the percentage? Not a figure, but just a rough guesstimate percentage of what's, you know, it said legacy debt to, to Department of Finance and councils. I think it's overwhelmingly not to councils. That's okay, because I'm just thinking we know the state, or the, not the state councils are in, but we know councils are hitting a tough time too and are requiring um, bailouts from the department also. So to then cut another funding stream to council would be, um, would cause them a detrimental effect as well, I suppose. We, we can. Um there's no problem in getting you the, yeah. uh, the breakdown of that debt, mm -hmm. how, the schedule of payments to the 2036, yeah. capital interest, and who it's going to. Right. And yet again, but, even at 307 million, which is a massive amount of money, it's still not going to touch the surface or scratch the surface when it comes to what the housing executive require, albeit it would go, it would help certainly. Um, then are we then looking at <coughs> the only way then the housing executive, or not the only way, but one of the ways is for them to be in, to have the ability to borrow then, the way housing associations can do? Is that then what, what? Well, if they, if, if, it's either borrow or a big, a, a, you know, the a capital Dell. Okay. So we either, yeah, enable them to borrow the money from somewhere else or we give it to them ourselves. If we give it to them ourselves, um, obviously we, it, we would have to take it from somewhere. It would be roughly 100, 100 plus million a year for a period of 10 or 11 years. That's the shortfall, a billion over 10 or 11 years. That is, as an order of magnitude, that is a, the amount we currently put into new social housing bills. So I tend to think of it as uh, one of our options is to put that money into old houses rather than new houses. But that would that's be... That's not going to solve our housing crisis either. Well, exactly. That's yeah. our main way of trying to bring down housing stress is to increase supply. So, yes, if, if, if that's one solution and that's its downside, the other one is to... is to... Um, well, the housing executive's current classification as a central government body has those restrictions. So, yes, you would need a solution that changed that um, they're the only kind of the only kind of public sector entity that isn't covered by central budgeting guidance. I remember, uh, forgive me, Kelly, you asked me about this last time I was, uh, we were here talking on this subject, at least very briefly. Is a council. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't any other. So the conclusion you, you draw then is that in order to have, to escape the central budgeting guidance, you need declassify the housing executive as a public sector entity at that point. Yeah. And uh, you, so then you're talking about, yes, a social enterprise and not-for-profit sector. Yeah, and I think that's a conversation that we're certainly going to have to have um, as to what what would be best and what would be best financially. Uh, and I think we all realise that, that that conversation needs to take place. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask you about the rent increases. Um, and I understand that, um, that that has been very much part of the problem as to why we are in the position we're in been part of it, not the main part of it, but it has been part of it um, when it comes. I mean, we know uh, there we, we have our constituents are, are living in conditions that are pretty poor, um, so they are, and if they were in the, the, the another sector, they wouldn't get away with it. Um, so I was just looking at the rents. Um, I, I would be like against anybody, you know, some of those properties having rent increases because the, actually what the conditions the people living in don't deserve a rent increase. You know, so I think it needs to be looked at on the whole of, you know, some people will be living in, in very good accommodation and yes, maybe should have, should that rent increase should, should apply, but for others, they're not living in good accommodation. Um, and I mean, there's an argument there um, to look at the, the whole estate across the board to see what merits and what doesn't. So it's just a, a point really on that. Um, yes, the, um, the homes need investment. Yeah. Um, if... I think that what's another advantage to a, a if you have a um, solution that consists only in part of rent increases uh, and is otherwise features a large early capital injection, then you can you can somewhat have a cycle of the investment coming before certainly most of the long term program of rent increases. So you don't have that counterintuitive. You know, you tell me my home. Needs investment 
because the rent is low, so you're going to put up the rent, and only then do I get the investment kind of site. You know, you, so if you have the cap injection early, you can you can address that. I know somewhat. a similar thing happened. I know in uh, an area, one of the areas I represent in the Newton Abbey side of North Belfast, um, it was owned by a, a housing association who sold to another housing association, um, and it has extremely low rents. Always did, um, but there was an agreement was made that the rents couldn't be increased until um, the the work was put into those homes. To, you know, to bring them on a level that was actually merited that rent. Um, so uh, it, it has been done in the past with various housing associations. Yes. And the um, and normally the context is a very very firm contractual offer. Yeah. You know, th th yes, there will be rent increases, but there will be in return for an investment on this profile on this schedule yeah. in these in these different areas to your to your home. Okay, look, that's, that's me for now. Um, I've got Fra and Kelly down to speak. So, Fra, go ahead. Thank you, Frank. I think you, uh, uh, you touched on a couple of pertinent points, and I think it's something that we'll discuss forever at, uh, at, uh, at this committee. Uh, rent increases. Uh, again, uh, the, the housing executives themselves haven't built in, in decades, uh, so the, the, their houses have fallen into disrepair, mm -hmm. and that, that does need to be taken into consideration. And even the uh, the, the, you quote the, the housing association selling off to other, other uh, housing associations. When that runs out, uh, people are paying rents that are almost akin to uh, private centre rent, uh, rent, and it makes it almost impossible for people. It actually squeezes people out of uh, being able to, to afford. So you're, you're, you're caught up in the affordable, affordability. Uh, and I think all the stuff that we've, we've talked about here and that, 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 that you've raised, Paul, is that uh, you, you do, uh, at some stage, need a level playing field uh, in terms of how you, you deal with that. And I know the Minister has raised it here, uh, that, uh, that she's been fairly upfront and that she wants to tackle uh, the, the whole housing uh, crisis uh, as we, we, we see it. And I think that uh, what we need to do is to, to, to get a beginning to that and look at towards an end and how, how, how we do it. But somewhere, in, in, in it takes in uh, the historical debt, it takes in corporation tax, it takes in all those things there, uh, that, 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 that is a worry. I think one of the things that you raised, I think one of the, that had been spoke about the last time, and I heard you say, Kelly, it is that, is that, uh, that the ability, uh, whether you, you use it or not, but certainly the ability to be able to borrow uh, on the strength of 86,000 houses uh, may uh, have an impact uh, on, not on the levels of money. And would certainly you'd be told uh, a different uh, thing that uh, money is fairly cheap at the present time and it may allow you to, uh, to do something like that. But again, when you go, that, that's a way down the road. Uh, I, 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 I still um, I would ask it, how do we deal with our or what are we doing uh, to deal with uh, housing demand and housing stress and housing need? And I think that's a big thing that, that, that factors uh, in, in, in people's mind. But with all this debate is beginning, it leaves people in a, in a, a, a difficult position. You've still hustled, matter of fact, I was dealing with some this morning. And uh, the, the people being offered dairy or Korean or thing. And, th and that's just temporary accommodation. And then and the, the people that have been offered that have no ability uh, to either get there or get back in to take their children to school. So there's a serious, serious problem that we all need to get our heads around. And, uh, and, thing, and, and again, I note uh, that uh, the, the, the minister says that, yeah, that she would meet this committee uh, whenever they require. And hopefully that, that's one of the elements that we need to, uh, that uh, would factor very much in our mind. Um. I to me, I thought the main question was that how are we going to how are we going to reduce stress and increase supply yeah. uh, per se, and how, how are we going to address the housing crisis? The um, our minister is clear, and New Decade New Approach is clear on on a few main things. We there's a commitment in New Decade New Approach to increase the investment in new social home starts. So we currently build 18, 50 new social homes a year. That commitment presumably means we need to get that number up above that. Um, our minister is also clear we need to make that program better at putting those new homes in areas of acute need. Um, we have managed to pass the legislation that has enabled that 
programme, i.e. that has retained the private sector classification of housing associations, which means that we at least can, in theory, expand that programme. So that's the first thing. That obviously depends on the executive awarding that programme an increased capital budget. But our bids reflect the, the intent of New Tech New Approach, needless to say, and the, the ambitions of our minister. So that's the first thing, the social housing development programme. Um, there is then my colleague David Polly in charge of policy in, in housing policy in the department, um, in, if you like, in the other sectors, um, looking to do a number of things to try and get from the other sectors more interventions that will also help address housing stress. Um, so, uh, you know, more affordable supply in other sectors um, and other models of home ownership, etc. Like, you know, and we're trying to keep co-ownership going, etc. Um, but none of this will be additional. None of this will actually increase the capacity of our housing stock to meet demand if at the same time as we do these things, we lose the existing social supply we have. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an obvious point, but it's a really fundamental one. The, 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 the 86,000 homes is it's a sort of big number, but that, that is one in nine of all the homes in Northern Ireland. Um, and if the analysis shows if the housing executive can only afford investment requirement, about half of it, then it, it, it rings pretty true in their own analysis that there is a risk of losing the other half. There is a risk of deinvestment in the other half. So, you know, if we're talking about trying to increase the output from the social housing development programme up from 1850 to a number, it's never going to be an increase capable of offsetting the potential loss of over 40,000 social homes. So the, 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 there is an importance in doing the things that we talked about, about addressing increasing supply. But the Housing Executive Investment Challenge is about making sure those things are truly additional because it's about keeping the homes we already have. I hope that is a sort of answer. Yeah, that was, but uh, again, I think, uh, tied in, in, in the all that there, uh, the Housing Executive getting the ability uh, to be able to build again oh, yes. is also crucial to that. And uh, when you have difficulties, and hopefully getting over the difficulties, they also need to be built up uh, the, 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 the houses that they have? Yes, I mean, the, the, the current state of their existing portfolio is, is and its, its, its investment requirement is, is not a reflection on its inability to, to build again. It obviously, I, see, I know what you mean. It all dates from pre-1995 yeah. because they haven't been able to add their stock through building again since that point. But the, it's, their current investment requirement reflects under-investment in the years of low rent since the turn of the millennium. That's truly where it comes from. Um, if, if the housing executive were turned into a social enterprise in the not-for-profit sector, it would, um, it would retain the characteristics that make it possible for housing associations to build again under the current... So, you know, the old two-for-one argument that we have with housing associations would apply in a way it currently doesn't to the housing executive. Um, and the reason why currently the housing executive can't build again is a, forgive me, is a really good reason. It's because it would cost the government twice as much and would halve our output. Do you know, it, it's, 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 the, the, and, and that is a really hard-edged argument. That, I mean, there is a kind of, there is a, there is a nostalgia about the housing executive building again, but fundamentally, at the moment, to, in, to entertain it would, it would be about halving the output of the social housing development programme. Well, let's go and link up as we could, uh, say we could uh, debate that and argue it all day. Cool. Okay, Fred. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Kelly? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Um, can I just ask, with regards to the overarching MDNA uh, approach, the review of arm's length bodies, is that yourselves that are doing that review with respect to the housing executive or is there somebody else looking at that? It's the central sponsorship function in the Department of Communities. However, we have, uh, we have, we, we, it is through us that the housing executive has input to that, although so far that has just been an information collecting exercise as far as I'm aware, so I couldn't ask, answer any great detailed questions about what that review will mean for the housing executive. I just, I'm wondering because um, in that review, and it's going to include other large organisations, for instance, TransLink will be Northern Ireland Water through the infrastructure side. 
Um, the conversation, as we, as Fra has alluded to, about the future of the housing executive and being able to build again. In order to do that, they need to borrow. Northern Ireland Water has that set up as a company, although we don't use it, um, where it's owned wholly and completely by Northern Ireland. We all own it, uh, but it has to trade in an appropriate way. But it, it has the functionality to be able to uh, borrow. And I'm just wondering if that review of arm's length bodies is going to actually propose a solution to this housing executive issue that would change their functionality, their biz the how they're set up as a business, so that it's still owned by us. It's not going into privatisation, but it can borrow because it has a different um, look. I'm just wondering if there's somebody else looking at how that can happen. My recollection of the terms of reference for that review were not the work are that it would not. I, I've also um, my understanding about NI Water is that it cannot borrow. It, 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 it is restricted in, in, in that it can borrow, but under the same essentially prohibitive constraints that the housing executive can currently borrow, which are to the effect that it can't borrow. They can borrow. The, the Northern Ireland Water can borrow. The reason why they can't is because their income stream is a grant as opposed to income. You know, it can be, it's treated differently, whereas the rent for a housing executive isn't a grant. So there's, there's a slight variation there, but actually it would be easier for the housing executive to do that if the, if the changeover was better. But that's going back to my infrastructure days, but um, oh, the, the, the discussions I've had on that. One of the issues that was concerning for me um, is the level of reserve seems, I know it's a huge amount of money, £112 million, but it's very small for an organisation that has so many houses. So I actually wondered what's going on there, because if you had... If something terrible was to happen and you needed to rebuild all 86,000 houses, 112 million wouldn't touch that. I'm just wondering about that reserve. Is it just the known, known um, liabilities of redundancy and so on? Um, and I know you talked about um, in, the, in the paper about the large projects that you know come into different years, but it just seems to be quite light. I'm just wondering if there is a change in the housing executive, if it's given the 86,000 houses to continue on working with. Their ability to maintain those using a reserve fund or to build new is, is very limited. Is that because of the current setup? I'm j I'm just, I'm, I'm I think yes, it is. The, the, relatively speaking and historically speaking, that reserve is much, much higher than it has been. Um, however, if you compared the housing executive to a very large housing association uh, uh, elsewhere in the UK, say, uh, an 86,000 size landlord, they would probably have a larger reserve than 112 million, I think it's fair to say. Um, and I think they would have it and probably um, have it there in reserve because they were an independent registered housing association, not in effect underwritten by central government. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, broadly speaking, that is the answer to your question. But however, the housing executive want to get that money out. Um, the current level of reserve is a reflection of their difficulties in spending um, procurement difficulties, litigation difficulties that they engage in when they try and take forward large maintenance contracts. Um, uh, their plans to spend in the next three or four years, for instance, should they be realised, should they not encounter the same difficulties, would reduce that reserve significantly. Um, of course, that's in the context of them being a... Mm you know, a body supported by central government, covered by CBG, public sector entity. Your point is yeah, the right one. Were they a housing association, generally, they would have a larger reserve. Yeah, nobody would touch on the 10-foot barge pole because they're already bankrupt. You know, I look at it from the business perspective and just go, if you have to replace those, those buildings, those homes, 112 million wouldn't touch it. I would just be concerned that if we're going to... Our, is our ability to transform or reform the housing executive um, limited by that no. sustainability? No, I don't think. I don't think so. I think. Um, I don't think your 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 average housing association reserve reflects the. You know, it, it is of the size to replace all of the homes. Okay. It is larger, I think. I think than 112 million for a, for a landlord of that size, typically. But of course, it's not a housing association. Yeah. So I suppose so. At the moment, it's, it's an apple and a pear. Can I just ask then, I'm just keeping on this theme, because I'm thinking about the investment strategies and a lot of the investment for the future, the ability to borrow, is, is on how the housing executive is set up. So I just wanted to ask, Chair, um, the reform of housing, new decade, new approach 
did agree an outcome for housing, and I'm just wondering within the department, is there any progress or discussion on that outcome or consulting on that outcome and you know what it may include, like for instance, something like the reform or the a change to the housing executive? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I think that might be a question for our executive office. I think, um, yeah, I mean, there was a commitment <laughs> in a new decade approach to a housing outcome. I, I think we, we, we have done some work on it, um, but the, the, the matter is now being taken forward in the context of the developing programme for government, which will, will or will not ref, you know, reflect that NDNA commitment on, that, on a housing outcome. But I, so, I mean, I could maybe take away an action and try, try and find out for you what, where it is, but I think I, would be, I, I will end up going to the executive office, I think. Is that right, Eloise? It's just that yes. I, I was concerned because it has been mentioned in other papers for the department about the outcome, and, and I know that something has been done, but it's very difficult to get a hold of that. Like, for instance, if there's a future housing strategy, you'd imagine it would be in that outcome. Um, it's just getting a hold of that. The one, just the last one, the rent increase. The former minister, Deirdre Hargey, had mentioned um, the increase in rents that was planned to happen. Just where are we with, with all of that now? Rental increase. She um, decided to introduce for 2021 a rent increase of consumer prices index of rate of inflation plus 1%. Um, she decided that in January, which is when these decisions get made every year. Then the uh, pandemic happened. So she decided, I mean, just before the rent increase was about to take effect, late March, to defer it. And it's, being defer it's been deferred until it will, it will start on the 1st of October. 1st of October, okay. And I'm just thinking because of the situation We've heard from the Prime Minister um, that impact. There isn't any plans to extend that deferral. It's, it's definitely 1st of October. Yeah. And there's no issue then with the universal credit and the increase then to housing benefit that will result from that? Uh, n n no, that has, been, that has been worked on specifically in the housing executive. No. Thank you. I know I've asked you a lot of questions, right. but it's, it's something I'm so passionate about. But thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kelly. OK, I don't have any other members who have indicated they want to speak. Sorry, Mark's now waving at me and Robin. So, Mark, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Paul, for the, the presentation. Uh, I suppose Fran Kelly touched on, on many of the things there, or points that, that I was going to make, but it was just like, I think, regardless of any commitment, the new decade, new approach, and you know, or any review of arms length bodies, I think we have to look at what the last review of the housing executive, when it was carried out, what its recommendations were, and what has happened since. You know, as far as I'm aware, that completed in 2011. But uh, has anything been done since? Um, I, I, I'm going to have to ask Eloise for a bit of help here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, if the 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 Splitting of the body into, on the landlord side, a public corporation, and on the regional side, an NDPB, uh, may be a result of that review. But um, other than that, I'm not sure. Do you know, Louise? Nothing generally on the housing executive. I don't think the work since 2011 has focused on ensuring its financial sustainability by looking at potentially how those two halves work. It's, it's, it's well, frustrating. I'm sure it's equally frustrating from uh, where, where you're sitting that here we are nine years later and we're talking about the need to carry out a review and plan a, a, a best way forward. I'm not saying that I know that best way, nor do I underestimate the challenge, but the challenge is even greater now than it was in, in, in 2011. I just wonder what the, the obstacles or barriers have been to, to progressing uh, recommendations of that or that came from that review. They, by review, sorry, Mark. I'm just checking. I'm getting what you mean. I mean, there was a, there was some earlier work conducted in 2009 and I think in 2011 by PwC and others that yeah, was, was essentially I'm not is, that, is, on is this what we're talking about? Which essentially was pointing out ten years ago, though, the same basic analysis, which is that there was an investment requirement looming and that the housing executive was not going to be able to afford it. Um, if, if that's what we're talking about here, then, then, then yes, indeed, there, there has not been a, 
a, uh, a, an agreed solution implemented to address that analysis. It has since got more severe, and we are now at the point where we need it even more. I mean, that, I, that's the case. And are you able to identify or, or pinpoint the, the difficulties that there have been in agreeing a solution to it? Or is that all too political? Well, I, yeah, I, you might know more than me. <laughs> I think I, well, I mean, they're, they're, they're really significant decisions around the the the, the status of a of a, an important institution in Northern Ireland and about how much rent to charge social tenants. So. I think those would always be really difficult political decisions, but, but I'm guessing as to what the reason um, is. Okay, and, and just, uh, Paul, you mentioned there the fact that we're building, I think, 1,850 new starts a year. That's what we're aiming to build. How many are we actually, or have we been managing to build? Uh, well, in, in 1920, uh, we built 763. But that was because of COVID. Um, well, was it really? Because your COVID just struck mid-March. Were we going to build over a thousand in the last two weeks? I mean, start? the answer is yes, we were. I, mean, I know that sounds silly, but it, the target is about starts, about getting on site. The programme is it achieves because of the nature of the planning process and and how annual budgets forces this exercise into a year currently. The program no, achieved, so the program achieves nearly all of its output in the last two weeks of March. So when COVID no, started, the last I'm the story of that and the Anna Jones scenario where yeah. they're trying to get applications on so, and approved. So last year's low, last March, year's low just figure seemed, seemed to top about too much definitely. So last year's low figure is a is a serious anomaly. Other, otherwise, we have failed once in the last eight or nine years to to reach the target, and that was in in 1819. We had a target of 1850, and we had 1786. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and that was because, again, this end of March scramble, a scheme dropped out. We didn't get planning approval, I think, or I think, well, the contractor yeah. may have withheld his signature at the last minute, and that's what, that's what happens. But otherwise, in previous years, we'd set targets that sometimes were higher. They got up as high as 2,200. Um, but uh, we were either met or were, or were missed by that sort of amount on one occasion. So by and large, we do. I'm sure, I'm sure you'd probably like to see a change in that funding model as well, though, where it does put all the pressure on. And March, because I know even from a planning perspective, it creates difficulty for, for councils when applications, like an avalanche of applications coming in in March for, for social housing. And often we're saying because they have a social housing sticker on them, yeah. uh, it, it, it's very difficult to get even... Uh, regardless of the merits or other ways of an application for uh, committees to, to refuse them. And I'm not suggesting they should be looking to refuse them unless there's good planning uh, reasons to, to do so. But it, it, it does make it very difficult for planners as well, as not, not just planning committees, but for the actual planners themselves, because they know the need is out there. They know uh, the importance of quality, new and quality uh, social homes being approved, but it's all operating to the, the budget cycle. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just far from satisfactory. I'd say you'd share that with you. Yes, and the, uh, yes, we end up in a situation where emergency planning meetings are being convened in the end of March by councils to try and pass schemes that we need to achieve our targets. It's not ideal. Multi-annual budgets is, is one of the answers. It's good that we're now, and it's, that was a commitment in new decade, new approach. It's good that we're now, we've just gone through uh, department, and with all the other departments has taken part in, a, in a, budget, a, bu a budget planning exercise stretching three, four years forward. So hopefully, maybe things will be different. It might take a few years, but things will be different in the future, and uh, we won't have quite this difficulty. But um, I, I would stress the point, so, but by and large, the target has been, has been met. Uh, and in the one or two years in the last 10, when it has not, we're talking, with the exception of COVID, we're talking, you know, 95% of the target and, 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 and just missing it at the end. OK, no, thank you, Paul. OK, Mark, thank you. Robin? Uh, thank you, Chair, and I apologise for being late to uh, uh, arrival. Uh, it's in connection of, for us as, sorry, me as slow learner. You made a comment to Mr McCann, who'd asked you about the housing executive being able to build again. 
And uh, if, unless I've picked you up wrong, you said that the, if the housing executive were to build again, you would get half as many houses and they would uh, co be cost, there'd be twice the cost. Just, just explain that to me, because I well, don't so, um, we, um, a social home, new social home currently costs about 140,000, typically. Three bedroom social home. <coughs> Total cost to build, including land, would cost between 130 and 140,000. Um, we grant fund the Housing Association about 70, let's say 70 grand of that, okay? We do it in broad terms. Because it's a housing association, because it's not com covered by central budget guidance, because its borrowing doesn't score in terms of public expenditure, it can borrow the other 70, um, which means that our pound is joined by another pound and we can build twice as many homes as we, as, as we can with a housing association. With the housing executive, because it's a public corporation, because it is covered by the central budgeting guidance, because its borrowing does score in public expenditure terms, it couldn't do that. We, we would have to give it all 140. So our budget would go half as far. Does that make, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, but that, that's, that's precluded. Uh, that's the model of the housing executive as it was established. As it is now. Uh, as, as, it is, as it is now. So we bet uh, an indication of the potential of the housing executive. I, I, I take that point. I, I, and indeed, I say, if, were it to become, and I don't want to presume what's going to be the response yes. of my minister and the executive to the investment challenge, but were it to become a housing association, yes. it, it, oh, I, 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 that may be because that may be an attempt to address the investment challenge, but a, a side benefit, a consequence of it, would also be that it would... It would, it would have the same advantages as the housing associations that I just described, and it would make sense for it to build again in the same way it makes sense for them to build. Yes. See, I, I suppose uh, the... Uh, and I'm like Mr McCann, I would like to see the housing executive building uh, again, and particularly in, in the circumstances that are emerging around the high-rise buildings, the high-rise, the tower blocks, uh, and you know the, the the need for the housing, additional housing that that will create. This footprint that becomes available is so small, mm -hmm. uh, and the housing executive, I think, and I can't see how the other housing associations will address that issue if the housing executive are not by that stage allowed to build. That's my scenario. Uh, I suppose. And and that's we're a really playing, good we're playing, sort of. This is a really good point. I mean, but I suppose the best way to answer that is um, you know, civil servants like us has to have a business case to support our expenditure. At the moment, when we when we draw up a business case to to govern what how to build new houses, we will always have an option in which a housing association will bring half the cost versus another option where our housing executive we would have to give it all of the cost. Yes, yes. And it, one will always get defeated by the other. Now, if you have a business case for, for a kind of supply where the housing association option is not an option, yes. that might be different. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, and also, if the housing executive were one day to become a housing association, again, yeah. then suddenly the, the two options are the same. No, I, I, I understand that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure. just uh, well, glad you asked that as well, because then that, I see then the reasons why mixed tenure housing has caused problems for some housing associations then, because they can't get the the the, the, the value back in, in some areas, and that's one of the reasons why, is because of the, the yes. part funding by the housing executive isn't yes. enough to cover the price of a of a, a three-bed, £140,000 house, which they would never get in some of the mixed tenure areas. Um, so um, I'm just asking on that, and you might not be able to give me an answer on it, but if the, the housing executive had the ability, say we, we the overhaul had taken place and had the ability to build, what would that work with mixed tenure for them? Would that, still, would that be an option then, even if um, they were in the position to borrow, to build, and um, would mixed tenure still be an option? Do you mean because they'd have the ability to build because they were a housing association? Yeah. Yes, it would. Yeah, OK. No, that's it's, a big, it's a couple of big ifs in there. But yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I know that. Big, big ifs. <laughs> yeah, we'd like to look at the future being bright, so we do. So, yeah.
No, I think that everybody that wanted to ask a question has asked a question. So thank you. Thank you both very much for coming in and joining us today. And no doubt we'll see you in the very near future again. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, members, just take your ease for a moment because we need to dust down. I can't see Fra from there now. You're not missing on I don't like to see Fra. You'd have to tell me if he's missed me here. Okay, members, just remember we're still alive at the moment. He's sagging for All right, members, we're going to move on then now to agenda item number six, which is a departmental briefing on the pension scheme bill. Um, we've been provided with papers and they're at page 27 of your meeting pack. And also included in these papers is the assembly research bill paper, which members were briefed on at last week's meeting. So we'll just wait um, till our guests join us. Hello, everybody. Hi, Jerry. How are you? Lorraine, just make yourselves comfortable and we'll start as soon as you're ready. You should get all your bits of paper out. Okay, I've got the right glasses on there. I'm just checking to put the reading glasses on here, just in case. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much for having us here today. You're um, very welcome. I, uh, uh, we, we have actually got a wee short opening statement okay, where we're just going to go through the bill again for you. No, okay. okay, to outline the various uh, uh, things in it, and then afterwards we should be able to answer any questions, hopefully. Mm -hmm. That's what you have for us. Okay, Doreen's going to do that. Okay. Can... Once again, we are pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today about the Assembly Pension Scheme <coughs> Bill. The bill corresponds to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2017. The main purpose of the bill is to introduce a new regulatory framework for master trusts in Northern, Northern Ireland. The bill is divided into three parts. Part one, which is the majority of the bill, 40 clauses and three schedules, introduces an authorisation and supervision regime for master trusts a form of multi-employer occupational pension schemes. Part two introduces a cap ban on early exit charges and member born commission that arise under existing arrangements as well as new arrangements. And part three contains general provisions relating to interpretation, commencement, assembly control, etc. We have already provided the committee with fairly comprehensive written briefing on the bill. If you are content, I will run through the main provisions of the bill. Yes, please. Part one, Master Trusts. The pensions landscape has changed significantly over recent years, and as a result, the way in which people can save and access their pension savings has been transformed. Automatic enrolment has resulted in a significant increase in the number of people being enrolled into a workplace pension. Master trusts have become a popular vehicle for employers, particularly small and micro employers, seeking to enrol employees into an occupational pension scheme. A master trust is a form of multi employer occupational pension scheme for unconnected employers where Instead of the employer setting up their own pension scheme, schemes provided by an external organisation which runs a pension scheme for numerous employers. Such schemes offer benefits to both employers and members. They can spur competition in the market and allow for economies of scale, providing value for money. 
They are also an efficient solution for small employers for whom setting up an individual pension scheme would be difficult and prohibitively expensive. Currently in Northern Ireland law, master trusts are regulated in accordance with occupational pension legislation. However, that legislation was developed with single employer pension schemes in mind, and consequently it doesn't take into consideration the different structures and dynamics of master trusts, which give rise to different risks. The bill is a response not to a fundamental problem with master trusts, but rather to the exponential growth in membership. In 2010, across the UK, there were 0.2 million members of master trusts. By November 2019, across the UK, there were 16 million members in 37 master trust schemes, holding more than 36 billion in assets. The introduction of a new authorisation regime is designed to address a legislative gap and to try to prevent problems arising in the future. The aim is to ensure that essential protections are put in place in a way which is proportionate to the risks experienced by master trusts. The bill defines a master trust as an occupational pension scheme which offers money purchase benefits either alone or in conjunction with other benefits to be used by two or more employers who are not connected to each other. In broad terms, money purchase benefits are derived from a pot of contributions together with investment returns from the contributions. Where a scheme offers a combination of money purchase and other benefits, the requirements generally only apply to the extent it provides money purchase benefits. The definition is broad and this is designed to discourage schemes from changing their structure to avoid having to seek authorisation. Under the new regime, master trusts will be prohibited from operating unless authorised by the pensions regulator. The bill sets out specific requirements which must be met in order for a scheme to be authorised. For example, the, pension, the, sorry, the persons involved with the scheme are fit and proper persons. The scheme is financially sustainable. The scheme funder has met specific requirements. The systems and processes used in relation to the scheme's governance and administration are sufficient to ensure that the scheme runs effectively and the scheme has adequate continuity strategy. Under the fit and proper persons requirement, the regulator must be satisfied that those carrying out key roles meet the necessary standards. For example, the regulator will assess whether they have the knowledge and skills to carry out the roles, their connections to the employer, etc., whether they have been disqualified as a trustee or director, or been insolvent or failed to comply with regulatory requirements. The key roles are a person who establishes the scheme, a trustee of the scheme, a person who has the power to appoint and remove trustees, a person who has the power to amend the scheme, a scheme funder and a scheme strategist. In regard to financial sustainability, the regulator must be satisfied that the Master Trust has a sound business strategy and sufficient resources not only to run the scheme but to protect members where the scheme winds up. The scheme must prepare and annually review a business plan and submit it to the regulator. In relation to the scheme funder requirement, the scheme funder must be a separate legal entity and will make their financial position and the financial arrangement between them and the master trust more transparent. The system and processes requirements mean that the regulator must be satisfied as to the adequacy of the master trust administration and governance arrangements. The intention is that these will cover matters such as IT systems, administrative processes and processes relating to the appointment and removal of trustees, etc. The bill also provides that the Master Trust has a continuity strategy which will set out that members will be protected in the event that something happens which puts the sustainability or viability of a Master Trust in jeopardy. This is known as a triggering event. 
The strategy must also set out the level of administration charges that apply to members. The strategy must be submitted to the regulator for authorisation. Turning to the ongoing supervision of master trusts, the regulator is being given new powers to supervise master trusts, enabling it to intervene where schemes are at risk of f falling below the required standards. The aim is to ensure that the regulator is satisfied that the master trust continues on an ongoing, ongoing basis to meet the authorisation criteria and other obligations, including relevant legislation and codes of practice. To facilitate this, master trusts will be required to submit annual accounts, to submit supervisory returns, and to notify the regulator of significant events. The scheme funder will also be required to submit annual accounts. The submission of annual accounts to the regulator is necessary for the regulator's ongoing financial supervision of the scheme. It also enables the regulator to risk assess the solvency of the scheme funder and the funder's ability to provide funds to the master trust. Similarly, the supervisory return, which is to be submitted to the regulator on request, is an important tool for the regulator to be able to assess the master trust against the authorisation criteria on an ongoing basis. It is intended that the regulator may require information to be included in the supervisory return, such as how the trustee's competence is being maintained, details of the scheme strategies, professional development, the scheme's current position in relation to the objectives set out in the business plan, etc. The regulator must be notified in writing if significant events occur in relation to an authorised master trust scheme. The intention is that the list of significant events will capture events which could affect the ability of a master trust to continue meeting the authorisation criteria. For example, the scheme may have a change of trustee as the fitness and propriety of a trustee is linked to the authorisation <coughs> criteria. The regulator must be informed of such a change so that the new trustee may be assessed against the relevant standards. Other significant events could include, for example, a significant change to the investment principles or business plan, or where someone carrying out a key role is convicted of an offence, enters bankruptcy, or is disqualified as a company director, etc. A key part of the new regime for master trusts is a requirement to take specific actions where a key risk event occurs in relation to the scheme. These are known as triggering events. Triggering events include the regulator issues a warning notice in respect of the decision to withdraw the scheme's authorisation. The regulator issues a determination notice that the scheme's authorisation is withdrawn. The regulator issues a notification that a master trust is operating without authorisation. An insolvency event occurs in relation to the scheme funder. The scheme funder is unlikely to be able to continue as a going concern. The scheme funder decides to end the relationship with the master trust. The scheme funder ends the relationship with the master trust. The scheme funder, scheme strategist or trustees decide that the master trust should be wound up. An event has occurred which allows or requires the master trust to be wound up and the trustees decide that the master trust is at risk of failure. When a triggering event occurs, the trustees must pursue one of two continuity options. Under continuity option one, the trustees transfer members accrued rights to another scheme and the master trust is wound up. Under continuity option two, the trustees seek to resolve the triggering event. The trustees must submit an implementation strategy to the regulator setting out how the interests of members are to be protected following the occurrence of a triggering event. When the regulator approves the implementation strategy, the trustees must pursue the continuity options set out in the implementation strategy. The regulator will always seek to support and assist those involved in the running of a pension scheme. However, there need to be clear consequences for schemes which fail to comply with their duties. The bill therefore provides for civil penalties to apply where there is a failure to comply with duties under the bill. 
as information gathering is an important part of the regulator's toolkit and the Pensions Northern Ireland Order 2005 already makes it a criminal offence for individuals to fail to provide information requested by the regulator, the Bill extends these powers to include those involved in the running of master trusts. Ultimately, the regulator also has the power to withdraw a scheme's authorisation, essentially forcing it to leave the market. These powers are designed to ensure that those managing master trust schemes continue to work to protect the interests of members. Turning to the remaining provisions in the Bill. Part 2, Administration Charges. Since the introduction of the new pension freedoms in April 2015, which enable many people aged 55 and over to access their pension savings more flexibly, individuals faced a range of potential barriers, including incurring early exit charges when seeking to access their savings. Schedule 18 to the Pensions Act, Northern Ireland 2015, allows the Department to make regulations that restrict the charges or impose requirements on certain pension schemes. The Bill amends the 2015 Act to allow the Department to make regulations to provide that any term in a contract which is inconsistent with something in the regulations made under Schedule 18 is overridden. For example, if a contract that is in place between the trustees or managers of the scheme and a person who provides services to the scheme permits an early exit charge that is higher than the level of the early exit charge cap when it is introduced, this would allow that term to be overridden. This supports the policy intention of capping early exit charges in occupational pension schemes and banning member-born commission arising under existing contracts, those which were entered into before the 6th of April 2016. In conclusion, the pensions market is continually evolving and modernising. It is clear that there is a need to ensure there is adequate regulation for master trusts, given how they have developed since the introduction of automatic enrolment. An equality impact assessment on the proposals was consulted on between December 2016 and February 2017. No adverse impacts were identified. By most standards, automatic enrolment can be considered a success. The Bill aims to ensure <coughs> that members are only enrolled in high quality schemes which look after their interests. Well managed schemes will help to secure pension incomes in retirement. The bill, therefore, is firmly centred on further safeguarding workers' pensions. We look forward to working with the committee as it completes its scrutiny of the bill. Today has been very much an overview, and no doubt the committee will wish to examine the detail of some of these provisions during clause-by-clause -clause scrutiny. Thank you. We will do our best to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Doreen. I know this is extremely technical, so thank you for your very in-depth explanation there. I just have a couple of questions. Um, it's, um, do we know how many people in Northern Ireland at the moment are already part of Master Trusts? And secondly, um, we know that um, just over a year ago, a local pension provider, the, local, the Workers' Pension Trust, became the first in Northern Ireland um, to be awarded Master Trust by the, uh, the authority, um, so, or by the regulator. Um, how was that doable without us having the legislation here? Was that passed by Westminster? Or? I, so the trust which you're speaking about, it's one which has uh, its members here inside Northern Ireland yeah. and also members in England, Scotland and Wales. Therefore, for, for it to be able to have members inside England, Scotland and Wales, that meant that it had to first seek to be authorised under, under the law in England, Scotland and Wales. And, I, and that's how they have ended up and being authorised. And that allowed it to, to operate yeah. here as well? I, from our point of view here, I think that we were very happy because we knew that they were going to meet the standards which we were hoping to bring in yeah. such once the Assembly came back. So we were quite happy for that situation. And as I asked her, do, or do we know how many people in um, Northern Ireland are any parts? of the overall numbers yeah. involved, I think for the scheme which you're mentioning there, I think there's about over I, I, and it's 100,000 in it. Really? Okay. Um, but now it's in terms of, of, of the overall numbers, we, we actually don't know because some could be in, inside other schemes which are based in England, for, uh, for example, so we don't have an accurate figure for that. Okay. 
No, that's okay. That's all I wanted to ask at this time, Kelly. You had know, indicated you wanted to ask something. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the overview. It is quite technical, but um, please forgive me if I'm asking questions that seem quite simplistic, but it's just I don't see it in, in what's been put in front of us. The pensions regulator, can you just confirm in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland their role? And is there a legislative piece that we can review in advance of, of the work that we will be doing on how they can... Um, control master trusts in Northern Ireland. I know it's all spelled out here, but I'm just not sure what their responsibility is here. Right. It seems to differ from GB to here. Um, no, um, well, like the role of the pensions regulator, I, and of course once this bill has, has been brought in, I, as the role should be the same inside England, Scotland, Wales and NI. There is no difference. It's the only difference we have at the moment is the fact there's some of the things which the I, and so the pensions regulator here is, isn't able to do now. For example, if we had a scheme here which, which actually falls under this master trust, for example, but the pensions regulator as such couldn't uh, I, as such go into their premises and I could take documents if, in fact, they thought they were up to no good, I'm, I'm simply because we don't have this law here at, at the moment to allow them to enter into the premises. So, so those would be one of the examples where they don't have the full suite of powers available to them. But as soon as we pass this bill, then I can't really think of any area where, where, where in fact, we differ. That was one of the things I just wanted to check as well. The criteria is set for the pensions, re or the pensions regulator set the criteria that a master's trust has to fulfil. What happens if a master trust is not based in the UK? Well, actually, I, for the purposes of these laws, but it has to be based inside the UK. Okay. Um, these, these, are, these are schemes which are based in, inside the UK. Um, I, I should check that point out to make I'm absolutely sure, but I'm but, um, you know, absolutely, almost absolutely certain, yes, the that they have to be based inside the UK. Um, the changes that are coming forward, it's just we may have opportunities could come up where Master Trust could be from within Europe, USA, wherever, yeah. um, and it would be great if our pensions regulator that seems to have such a good, you know, okay. opportunity to protect people's pensions. Um, I, I think they are all, I think they are based inside the UK, but I shall uh, you know, certainly check that point out. It, it's just in terms of uh, such cross-border schemes in general now, but they are actually, uh, it's a fairly rare. Um, I, I think it was asked before by the committee about the number of schemes which operated between here and the south, and, and, and in fact there's only nine. Okay, which are based inside the UK, which operate in, inside the South, and um, for example, so it's a fairly small number. who are actually, in, you know, it's engaged in the, in the in the overall pensions market. Now. I mean, not just doing things, but but I certainly will I, to check that point out. It'd just be good because if yeah. we have uh, and to return to you on that, yeah, businesses mm -hmm. from outside of the UK who mm -hmm. have a branch here and, and their yeah. pensions elsewhere. And um, the other thing I just wanted to ask about. Um, Two questions more. The capping the early exit charge is fantastic. With private pensions, there is a provision of advice provided to the person who's, um, you know, taking out their pension pot at, at mm -hmm. an earlier age than their, their retirement age. Um, I'm just wondering. It doesn't mention it specifically within the papers that we have that um, there would be a requirement for the 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 trust to provide advice for those people. I'm very. Cons I'm just concerned that. Someone could see a pot at you know eighty or ninety thousand pounds. Take that early, which I think they can do now. They can take the yeah. full amount, and it, actually they 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 do you know they spend it on an endowment mortgage that you know to clear that yeah. off or give it to their children or whatever. Um, I'm just wondering if if there's built-in advice there coming from those. Um, I and in general, I and so pensions law. But if your pot is over a, a certain amount, then 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 I are required to take advice. Um, and is that provided by the trust, or is it is it provided? No, no, separate? no. That you take an uh, independent advice. Okay. In, in general, though, if you are moving uh, money from a pension scheme and something which you are working more and more, is to make sure that the scheme has to make sure that it isn't going into a scam, or or, or at least they have to ask the member, have, have you taken advice on on this point to make sure that it's not going off to buy uh, some hotel which doesn't exist somewhere. Exactly. Yeah, you know, you know, but that is a very major problem which we're facing, you know, okay. for scams. Thank you. The, the last one I have is, obviously, these trusts are going to have these master trusts are going to have a huge wealth of assets, you know, with the numbers that are now um, mm -hmm. potentially moving towards them. What protections will there be for people's pensions? I know we're talking about 
within the life of, of the master trust, there's there's certain criteria that they have to meet, and there's responsibilities to report, and, and if anything's going wrong, of course, they have to take actions. But, you know, some of these master trusts could be investing in weird and wonderful places. Um, is there a protection there that government be built in? We've seen banks collapse. Yeah. It wouldn't be outside of the realm of possibility, not now, but maybe in 10 years, that a, that a master trust could collapse. Right. Um, um, if you, if you ask me whether or not that they would have access as, as such to the PPF, the Pension Protection Fund, it's in general no, okay. because um, the only schemes which um, as a normal rule can apply are those which are linked to a, a such defined benefit system, okay, which would be the likes where you know at the end that you are going to get a, a set amount. The, these schemes are actually based on the amount of money which you earn, earn from, uh, from your pension pot. Um, so they don't have the same level of security. I, however, there would be um, a safety net in the event of fraud, for example. Uh, I'm saying that the, uh, the master uh, and trust scheme ends up being underfunded because of fraud, uh, and uh, there isn't any um, scheme funder, et cetera, to get the money from. Well, uh, then you know, there will be a, a fallback scenario there, but there wouldn't be the normal pension protection fund, which I think really you're asking me about. Yeah, it is. Well, I was a bit concerned about that. When we're going to be the detail, this well, well, uh, um, I mean, and I have to say there's a good reason for that. You know, the uh, the pension protection fund already is facing huge challenges, um, as I'm sure you know, and I think it's part of COVID as well. You know, we know there will be. You know, I suppose very many people should end up out of, out of work, etc. Absolutely. You know, so there will be challenges come, and there will be. I, I would expect it's a number of um, firms which may end up that they aren't solvent, and therefore that the fund is already facing. I, I think quite a you know, very stark challenges. I forgot about there. Um, just finally, I, I can't see how this is in, within the legislation that we're presented with. But does or the draft does the bill allow the government? to place additional criteria on master trusts, say, for instance, in the future, if the government decides for zero emissions, it wants master trusts not to invest in carbon emitting companies or whatever in the future. Can that happen through this bill? Um, and we don't have anything in this for uh, into climate change. However, I answer the Westminster pension schemes. Well, I think we sent you up some papers yesterday, which will be coming to you, no doubt. And, of course, uh, and there's one of those amendments I uh, actually deals with climate change mm -hmm. uh, and as to how schemes invest money, and that they have to be aware of uh, to climate change and actually what it might mean for the future of the scheme and also the move towards a uh, such low carbon e economy. So that issue is actually part of the Westminster right. Pension Scheme as well. But, but I say those papers come up yesterday, so you'll be seeing those in, uh, in due course. I'm thinking about future proof and um, climate change is one aspect, but if if government, something happens later on yeah. down the line and yeah. government says, actually, this is something we think that would be a good criteria to bring in, can the government change the criteria halfway through? Um, again, I would, I, would, I would have to read the clause again, for, which actually deals with certain criteria, and it could be there's a power by regulations to tweak. But I just wouldn't like to tell you that there is, if in fact there isn't, so I would rather go off and read it again to make sure the clause. Oh, thank you very as, much. As I'm sure you realise, there's quite a lot in this. There is. It's hard to keep in mind on every thank you last line of it. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Fra? Sure, just on that last point, I think we've, we've found out lately the government can do whatever they want when they're looking at it. You look at the the, the Brexit debacle and uh, if, they, if they want to change it. And I think many, many years ago there were serious problems in, 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 in terms of pension funds and uh, how people rated pension funds to, 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 to cover other things. And I think it was the, some of the questions that we had asked. Uh, to try and ensure that there was the added security there, so that it could. Uh, but in, in in terms of the last debate that we had in around housing, you know, the uh, it's it's funds like this here, and the likes of trade union funds, and the likes of credit unions that we had talked about, that have huge amounts of money that uh, that if they were allowed, uh, could actually come in and assist you and help you to deal with some of the housing crisis that you have, and other crisis that you might have to bring. Exactly. Good point. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, members, anybody else want to ask any questions? I don't see anybody's hands raised, so that's fair enough. Look, that's grand, um, Jerry and okay. Corin. Very good to see you. And that okay, paperwork, uh, I've been told that paperwork you sent will be in our packs next week. Oh, so well, well, yes, yeah. we'll come up to you, and I, I think we'll be back to brief you on. Yeah, and we we'll have the, the we have um, the oh, I haven't even got, can't even find it here. The 
that pension provider I spoke about earlier to you, Dr. Yes. Dr. Rivas, next week as well. Uh, uh, the workers' pension so, trust. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly it. I've my paperwork's everywhere here at the moment. So yeah. Okay. Look, thank you. Okay, we'll see you shortly again. Okay, that's good. All right. Thanks very okay, much. Okay, members, for and as again, um, we're just going to um, we'll just going to switch off here while we get everything cleaned okay. up for our next right. witness. Cheers. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, um, we're back again, and if we could turn to agenda item number seven, which is consultation on the regulation of gambling in Northern Ireland departmental briefing. Members, you've been provided with papers at page 143 of your unique packs. Um, Liam Quinn is unable to attend the committee today, but we have Michael McAvere, who is here in his place, and of course we've got Martina Campbell as well. So can I just pass over to yourselves and ask you if you would start your briefing? Okay, thank you, Chair, and again, apologies from Liam. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to brief on the outcome report of the recent <coughs> excuse me, consultation on the regulation of gambling. Uh, on the 16th of December, a 10-week public consultation on the regulation of gambling was launched. This sought the public's opinion on the current gambling law here and views on whether changes are now necessary to ensure we have a more flexible and modern licensing framework uh, capable of responding to the many societal and technological changes. The consultation ended on the 21st of February and we received a total of 382 responses. Um, so I think it's important to just say that although we publicly consulted, the consultation was launched before a minister was in place, so therefore there were no policy proposals included in it. It just asked for views on a range of issues. So uh, the report is still in draft form and minister is keen to have the committee's views before she makes any final decisions on the way ahead and uh, then once your views are, are received we'll obviously publish the report and Minister will want to announce her preferred way forward um, subject <coughs> to executive agreement and of course you'd be part of that. Um, so I'll hand over to Michael for a summary and we'll be happy to take questions uh, afterwards. Okay, thanks, Martina. Okay, Chair, I'm just going to give a very brief summary of the outcomes from the report. Uh, as Martina said, the consultation ended on the 21st of February and a total of 382 responses were received. The consultation was carried out via an online survey, although we did facilitate any hard copy responses that uh, came in. Uh, and it consisted of a series of questions uh, to be answered under each form of gambling, uh, betting, bingo halls, etc. Uh, people were also given the opportunity to comment just in general on any aspect of the gambling legislation at all that, that uh, took their fancy. Uh, the responses that we received, interesting enough, um, the majority, three quarters, just over three quarters, were from individuals or people that described themselves as individuals, uh, with the quarter being received from organisations. Uh, and the responses, for the purposes of the report, the responses from organisations were categorised into certain groupings, such as the gambling industry, local government councils, sports organisations, religious bodies. The headline results from it, just briefly, over three, just over three-fifths of the response believe that the law should be amended to permit casinos in Northern Ireland. 
uh, and those in responding in a personal capacity were more likely to be in favour of that, as opposed to someone on behalf of organisations, and the split was basically 70 70- 30%. Almost two thirds of all respondents believed that opening hours for bookmakers, uh, bookmaking offices should be relaxed. And of the respondents to that question, uh, those in favour, all of them were in favour of Sunday opening for bookmaking offices. Almost all respondents, 97%, uh, agreed that the gambling industry should contribute to funding research, education and treatment problem gamblers. Uh, a large majority of the respondents, 85%, agreed that the current law regarding promotional prize draws should be brought into line with the law in Great Britain. Promotional prize draws are where you are required to purchase a particular product to gain entry to the draw. Uh, and GB, that's lawful as long as there's no additional charges to the cost of the particular product, whatever it may be. Ninety uh, percent of respondents believe that the definition of a gaming machine and the technical standards associated with gaming machines should be updated to mirror those uh, in operation in Great Britain. And the majority of uh, overall respondents, 65% of them, agreed that gaming machine stakes and prize limits should be increased, also in line with the limits in Great Britain. Uh, lotteries, over two thirds, 68% of all the respondents agreed the lottery law should be amended to remove the one pound stake limit on society lotteries. That's what it stands at at the moment, and I think that's what it has been since 1985. Uh, Two-thirds, 67% of all respondents agreed that the law should be amended to permit the use of the internet in the sale of society lottery tickets. At the moment, as things stand, that's unlawful. Uh, There was strong support for a regulatory body for gambling here with over 9 and 10, 93% of respondents believing that an independent regulatory authority should be established here. That's just very briefly the the headline uh, items, so we're happy to take (coughs) any questions on the content of the report, Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll probably start where you finished off there, to do with the regulatory body, um, specific to Northern Ireland. Um, uh, do we know, or can you tell us what the thinking around that is at this stage? Not From the really other perspective. Uh, I mean, the minister is still considering all these issues, uh, and she's hoping to make an announcement <coughs> in the way forward in the coming weeks. But uh, no, it's it's. I, I know there's the gambling commission over in uh, GB. Uh, That's one option. There's the option to do it within the department. There's three or four options that are on the table, but nothing. There's nothing firm on it as yet. Okay. I suppose just want to mention at this point that I'm a member of the All Party Group in um, reducing harm and gambling. Just to uh, make make or just to sort of declare an interest there as well on that. And I know we've received uh, paperwork from Care and I, um, who've raised various issues um, around the the consultation. And um, I suppose we very much know that addiction and gambling um, is something that causes great, great, great problems in many families across Northern Ireland. Um, I know the Minister has spoken to the, the Health Minister on this. Um, it's just so if you're able to provide um, any information on how that is advancing, um, if, uh, you know, what role um, health might take on this. No, again, I mean, this is all very early stages. I, know it is. Like the, the, I, know. I mean, I should. Maybe just have said the consultation exercise, there were no proposals put forward. There was no minister when this exercise was initiated. So it was really an information gathering exercise. And and all of the options that you've just described there are things that are being 
sort of considered. Oh, and I absolutely about. get that. We're still very much early on here, yeah, and yeah. really, whenever we get the bill in front of us, will be our opportunity um, to get the various uh, interested parties in the room and look at how we, as a committee, might want to shape the bill in, a, in whatever direction we feel uh, it needs to be uh, shaped in. Um, I found it a bit strange to do with the um, the remote gambling and how that was evenly evenly split. Um, but again, that will be something I suppose whenever we see that uh, the bill in front of us that we'll be able to, to look and see what way the Minister's direction in that is. I mean, I do, certainly from my own perspective, um, do think that we do need a Northern Ireland specific um, very much legislation here. Um, I mean, there are, I know there's legislations in other jurisdictions, but ours needs to be the very best that it can be to protect people, especially around the addiction side of it. Um, I'm going to open up to some members, and I've got um, Sinead and then Robin. Thank you, Chair, and um, thanks to Michael and Martina for, for bringing this to us today. I know um, the Minister has given her commitment to try and bring this legislation through, um, hopefully within the, the lifetime of this mandate. Um, we can get as much of this as through as we can. I think just picking up on your point, Chair, about the independent um, regulator or regu regulatory body, I think that's very important. And I take on board your point um, in terms of the different options, and the Minister hasn't decided on, on that yet. But um, perhaps one of the ideas behind that is that there are, because I know a lot in other, other jurisdictions, um, regulators are, you know, whenever, whenever um, gambling uh, legislation and laws or with the responsibility of a govern government department very often they can be susceptible to lobbying and, and the, the, the gambling lobby is very very um, influential um, I think if there's a if we have a gambling regulator here a regulatory body that they must absolutely be independent and even you know we could even explore the option of them sitting outside this department you know so they're not answerable to um, to any sort of political um, political person or political um, influence um, Again, to her picking up on your point, I was sort of a bit um, bemused by some of the the responses yeah. about um, taken aback. Um, but I think the big the big headline ones, you know, I'm glad to see uh, in terms of the support for the levy, and um, the support for the the um, the regulator, um, and the people who were in favour of um, specific additional licensing and regulations for for here. Picking up on your point as well, um, Paula. Um, the only concern I would have is because we know how um, how much um, advertising plays a big role, um, mm. and I would just be concerned about what powers you know we would actually have in terms of regulating that, mm. um, because of course, I mean, the likes of the GEA they've completely banned um, alcohol and, and and gambling from uh, from the stadium from sponsoring teams, um, and I suppose that's something that the other associations here could look at as well. But you know we can't we've no power over you know Man United or whoever the team may be a Premier League team advertising alcohol or um, or, or a, a gambling uh, a betting uh, promoter on their shirts, um, and I don't even know what part we would have in terms of. Um, Watershed and you know online gambling or sorry online um, advertisements for gambling as well. So I'm just a bit concerned about how we would factor that in and what powers the department would actually have um, in terms of that because that's a huge concern um, for people. Uh, and uh, again, going back to the the um, the support for the levy, that's really good to see because I think we need to we need to come at this from a, a polluter pays. Um, mentality uh, and very much so that that should be the responsibility of the the gambling company so um listen i appreciate you won't have all the answers today or whatever and you know we're gonna be seeing more of this as it comes through the committee so yeah thanks very much okay. can i just add on to that and your final point there again about the levy and about um you know the the here 97 percent agreed that the industry should be helping fund research, education and treatment with problem gambling. Um, that needs to be to a significant amount, not just a, you know... A few thousand. Yeah, you know, that's not good enough, which I know is probably, well, from all I led to believe, is what happens at the moment. Um, it, it's pretty nominal what they, what, the, what they put into that. You know, when we know the harm of gambling and um, and we know how much that costs our health service and also and also socially, I must that got the cost of that as well. So uh, it does need to be at a, an amount that. And, I'm sorry, Chair. Just as well, again, <laughs> it's it's a worry of mine as well. Would be the online um, online gambling as well, and what part we have to regulate it. 
um, because I think that is something that needs to be looked at too. Because currently you can you can sign up for one of these online accounts. You can bet for seventy two hours before anybody actually checks that you are the person you say you are. I mean, you couldn't go into a bar and drink for three days and nobody ask you, you know, if you were suspicious what you did to produce your ID. So hopefully that will be in what comes before us. But it's just what parts we have to regulate. That would be my concern. Brilliant. Thank you, Sinead. Robin. As, thank you, thank you, members, for coming forward to this. Very much in line with uh, your, the comments you made about the old party group, uh, Chair. I think any legislation that's coming forward in this uh, response, I know this is only a survey, but you know, as, as it evolves, should be accompanied, Chair, mm -hmm. by information on the cost of gambling to society, mm -hmm. so that you don't look just at the uh, gambling in isolation, mm -hmm. but indeed you look at the cost of uh, loosening or additional gambling and what it is going to cost society as a whole, the public purse as a whole, uh, the pressures that it puts on statutory bodies. Very much in line with your comments, Chair, about the actual cost to society mm -hmm. of gambling and who pays for that cost. So if, if legislation is to come forward, uh, and if it is a change, and if it is uh, to 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 open it up, then there's obviously going to be a cost to that. I think we ought to know in round figures what that cost is going to be. Okay. All right. <coughs> okay. Thanks, Robin. Um, Kelly. Yes. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to something that has me a little bit confused, and oh. and and the responses. It's when we talk about gaming machines. Gaming machines, um, you know, it talks about when we go to figure 36, for instance, the overall responses on gaming machines as incidental attractions. And it does say, you know, that gaming machines are located, but they're also in chippies all over the countryside. Um, and I'm just wondering, when we talk about the levy that's being um, imposed on those people who provide it, a chip shop, for instance, or wherever it may be, can go out and buy one of those machines. Who, who, who contributes to the levy in that case? Well, they, they shouldn't be in chip shop in the I first place. I know they shouldn't, but they are, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. all over the countryside. Yeah. Where? Taxi, taxi, taxi licenses. Yeah. Where? Yeah. Walk into any chippy. Not <laughs> any the chippies I go to. Um, they are there, and they're oh, I know that. to flout yeah. the, the amount of money that they should be charged as well. Taxi, you know, there's lots of places where these are. Yep. So, with that in mind, and giving access to under 18s, there is, of course, talked about in, in the research about an offence um, to cause or permit under 18s to gamble. <coughs> I'm taking it that, that the organisation that has one of these gaming machines in it should be responsible, but if, if they are able to licence or get or be considered as an incidental attraction in a pub, for instance, um, should they be paying towards the fees? Or towards the, the support and help that people can need to do with gambling addiction? Well, pubs are permitted to have gaming machines in them. So they buy the gaming machine? They're not necessarily... Well, most, most of them, well, some, of them some would be bought, some would be rented. Yeah. They're not all the property of the, the bar. The but the, bar. the people that they're renting from... Yeah. or they bought from are not necessarily the people who made the gaming machine. It could be another company that's doing that. Yes. Yeah. So where because we don't have the the bookies, we don't have, you know, the, the gambling facility there, who would be would that mean that the person who buys that machine or rents that machine then should be contributing to to this um the sorry, the, the money that we're looking for to um, protect people, you know, the levy devices. Yeah. If whatever. If that's what Absolutely. you think should be the case. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come to that in a moment during that time. Yeah. Um, I'm not a member of the, the all-party group, um, but I have spoken with Gambling With Lives, and it, it really is very important that we do get um, the message out there that there is support. And as Robin has alluded to, it's almost like the cigarette packages where you say, you know, this is the damage that it can yeah. cause. Yeah. It would be good to have something, you know, that, that re-emphasises the risk that there is. Um, yeah, I'm really surprised at the amount of people who were looking for casinos. I thought that there would have been a lot less, but um, yeah, it, 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 some of the figures coming through on this are, are quite surprising. But yeah. 
They are what people have said, so yeah. we have to take the report as it is. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just on that, and I don't know if you're able to tell us, um, but out of that percentage of people who responded, how many of them, maybe says here, um, has an interest here in sections? Uh, I th well, do you have that? I think most of them um, were responding as individuals and didn't declare okay. any interest. Um, we did have that, don't we, Michael? Um, no, there was what organisations as well as. Um, yeah, two hundred and ninety-one respondents declare, uh, described themselves as individuals, but that's not to say that they yeah, yeah. they may have a, an ulterior motive. Just before I bring Johnny in, on just on the point that Kelly was making about um, those machines, that um, I noticed that if you go into any of the clubs, like their local bowling clubs there or whatever, um, they will have them locked up and the shutters will be pulled down on them. And um, so it's just when we look, we're looking at liquor licensing mm. laws and we're looking at having children on, on premises. Um, so it maybe needs to be a little bit of work done there um, between yourselves and... The other um, ones that are, yeah. um, Liam is is yeah. over both, so we, there we are. We do work closely. And, I together. mean, I know anywhere I've been that where I've seen them in, whether it's a bar, whether it's been a, a sports club or whatever, um, they are pretty well managed, and you know would be locked up unless somebody asked them for it to be unlocked. Yeah. You know, but you're quite aware, especially in sports venues and stuff, there will be children or under under 18s mm -hmm. there as well. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's a bit harder to manage. Right, it's just, a, more just very about, attractive to children. It's just a wee add-on there, just to the Kellys. Um, Johnny, you next. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, no, I suppose probably like all members, reading the consultation and survey actually probably. Uh, Creates further further questions as opposed to answers for for me anyway. Um, I suppose probably I would look around how ex, uh, how the officials feel that it, is it extensive enough? Like three hundred eighty two responses. Um, is that normal for a consultation such as this? I'm not sure. That's why I would I would like a wee bit further clarity on that. Um, I know it was more of an information gathering sort of exercise, but. I would, I would very much concur with what Robin has said in relation to further research that would be required to in, inform the debate here, uh, particularly around even uh, Department of Health statistics surrounding mental health related stats uh, of, of, the, of the impact and causes of gambling, and also from a Department of Communities in relation to those that are using uh, and accessing uh, services in relation to distress services, benefit service, etc., that can be linked of some description to gambling. I think that would be important for us to to try to hollow out and in, in informing this debate like the consultation itself i suppose like many think it, it seems to be so full of contradictions to me like you have three fifths believe law and um, the long um on allowing casinos should happen or should be relaxed to, to allow to happen two thirds believe bookmaker hours should be relaxed allowing in sundays but then on the other hand, 97% agree that there should be a levy uh, for gambling should be, you know, part used for educational purposes and provisions uh, and also support services. But the very, the very fact that they're allowing, they're, they're calling for casinos and um, increased hours and bookmakers is actually probably going to cause more harm uh, than the, the levy is going to be needed because of the actions that they're taking as opposed to trying to address them, the societal harms that gambling is called or caused in society. Uh, so that's just a point. I don't know if anybody else has the same, uh, judging by the comments, the same sort of confliction in relation to what the the, um, the consultation has thrown up. I'd agree very much with uh, Sinead and, and Chair Paula's points in relation to the regulatory body. It is crucial that it has its independence and it's, it's important that we really start to scope out. Uh, I know we will get that opportunity to do what sort of function and role that regulator would take. Northern Ireland specific and independent one would certainly be something that I would be supportive of. But that's just some comments and probably just a, a wee bit of information regarding the nature of this consultation and the response rate. Um, is, that, is that in keeping with, with consultations of, of similar nature? Um, yes, the uh, number of responses received would be classed as very good. Um, and 
I, I'm not sure. Do you know off the top of your head, Michael, about the liquor licence and the many responses? I don't know how many. Um, but we can get you that and write to you. But mm -hmm. certainly um, almost 400 responses would be classed as a good return. Mm -hmm. And yeah. on your point on the numbers presenting to services, um, we, Department of Health, don't um, collect that information because, as you know, there's no gambling specific mm -hmm. addiction mm -hmm. service. So the people are presenting for other reasons, whether that be through an alcohol addiction as mm -hmm. well or through mental health. So that mm -hmm. is definitely an issue that we're exploring with. Yeah. Department of Health. Um, I think I think that would be crucial, you know, and I understand what you're saying. It's, it's maybe hard to, to define it with a health setting, but um, sure, surely in this day and age, we we must be able. We hear from these from you know medical professionals themselves and their own constituents, you know, the damage that gambling can do in that light. And I suppose probably uh, it's trying for 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 us as a committee and indeed going for the minister and the department to get this right. There, there's a huge onus on us to get this right to ensure that we don't. Uh, cause further stress uh, on the system and I'm thinking in, in large in relation to a lot of those mental health provisions that are there at present within the hospital settings we already know that they're extremely overwhelmed and actions that we could take here in gambling legislation um, in fact ha have a knock, a knock on effect to that regard and um, just a one other point as well and I think the chair touched on this was in relation to how many of the respondents indicated of an independent nature it, it may be easy to to, to indicate independent whether or not they truly are is another uh, crucial question to ask. I don't know how else we could gain an evidence-based approach, whether it's through community-style consultations, uh, surveying. Um, I, I think probably trying to get people to engage mm -hmm. with this t type of legislation from an, as neutral a standpoint as is possible to achieve would be crucial uh, to guide us on uh, a legislative way forward. Yeah. Okay. I just, uh, there was a, another point I wanted to add on in there. I saw another, now it wasn't a, wasn't a, a questionnaire that was done by the department, but another one to do with gambling where the majority of their respondents were women because yeah. it was women that were yes. affected, um, both by trying to run a household and everything else. Um, so that, it's just when I hear you say that was a really good return and it's, you know, and they're, want, and they're mainly from individuals and they want to see, mm. you know, this much better yeah um, yeah it, it just um, flags alarm bells so it does especially you know and I, I say I haven't seen another one that it, the majority of respondents were women because they yeah. were the ones that were having to pick up the pieces nine times Absolutely. out of ten so I mean yeah. it, it is a really difficult one that we're going to have to work I our mean, way through it, and it'll be a very fine balance between giving some relaxations mm -hmm while still maintaining some form of uh, regulatory framework yeah. and uh, I guess it depends on a lot on how we um, frame the legislation and um, what is doable in this mandate yeah. and what is doable um, then mm -hmm. in the next. Okay, all right, I don't think there's anybody else who wants to ask anything further on that. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. And Thanks. yeah, that's. It was just uh, had a conversation here with the clerk about uh, for us to bring back a draft report to the committee and for the committee to have a wee look at next week or the week after, and then we can send that through then of some of the concerns then that we have, if that would be helpful. Okay, that would be yeah. very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Look, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you again. Yes. All right. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item eight, which is correspondence. You will find that at page two six three um, of your meeting packs, and you'll see the the correspondence memo. I just want to bring um, one thing up, so I do, and that is the letter that we had got from um, the women's uh, regional consortium um, to do with the impacts on 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 women and. Uh, with the, the welfare reform and universal credit. I, 
I know I, I also chair the All-Party Group on Women, Peace and Security, which is really, I suppose, the only All-Party Group we have at the minute here that is, you know, very much to do with women. And this issue has come up also, the impact of COVID-19 has had on women. I would be interested with if the, the, the committee were in agreement um, to get in a briefing session from them, um, if that would be uh, in agreement with the committee. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Okay. That's the only thing I wanted to highlight on the correspondence memo. Can I ask if any other members want to highlight anything there? Nope. Everybody okay then with the memo as drafted? Yes, please. All right. We'll move on then to agenda item number nine, which is our forward work programme. Um, just to inform members that at the meeting on the 30th of September, we will be briefed by the Minister. Members will, members will also receive a departmental briefing on the October monitoring round and from the Workers' Pension Trust on the Pension Schemes Bill. Can I ask members, have they any questions or queries on Agenda Item 9? Are we happy to move on? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Moving on then to Agenda Item Number 10. Any other business? Any other business members? No. No, nope, that's good. Then we'll move on to Agenda Item... Oh, sorry, Mark has got his hand up there. Did I miss that somewhere? Mark, sorry, did I you have your hand up? I was trying to get on, on the gambling one. I know Sorry, uh, Martin, I didn't see you. Martina and Mike, Michael are away now, but I, I, I suppose I had a question or two for them, but the other thing's more a general point, I think, for us as a committee uh, to consider when considering this legislation. I think Martina hit the, the, the nail on the head there when she spoke about the, the need for balanced legislation and the balanced approach to this. And like the number of respondents to the, the consultation, I think is lower than the one that the, the, the licensing or the licensing one we, we've been discussing uh, recently. And I don't know if it's right that because we are maybe surprised or some of us are surprised at what the responses say or the volume of responses, that we somehow question the veracity of them. Do you know someone sitting around the... The fact is that there, there are lots of people out there uh, who gamble responsibly, who enjoy it. It's actually a social... Uh, outlet for a lot of people, that's in no way detracting from the serious damage that they can do to individuals and families. I know myself, some families that have been uh, ruined as a result of it, but, but I think it's important that we retain and maintain that balanced sort of view and approach as we go forward, because we also have to be cognizant, I suppose, of the number of people employed here and the, the, the gambling industry, and I, I take on board what Sinead had to say about the very positive and brave step, in my view, that the GAA had taken around uh, sponsorship, you know, and excluding uh, alcohol or, or bars and uh, gambling companies from advertising in, in their stadia or sponsoring their, their rigs or whatever. But we have to be mindful too. We've done a lot of talking lately about the financial plight of sports clubs and associations here, and like uh, a, a lot of those might depend heavily on bookmakers, local bookmakers, at that. So we have to be, I suppose, aware of any implications for them and for that wider sporting fraternity of any decisions that we might make going forward as well. No, look, Mark, thanks for that, and apologies. I didn't see your, the wee icon on our screen at the time, um, so apologies for not letting you in, but what, what we are doing then is we're going to put a draft report together, so if any of those comments will be fed into the draft report from the committee, and the, the committee clerk is just telling me that the responses to the licensing was well over a 1,000, so actually yeah, it, was... it wasn't that many, you know, whenever we look at, at yeah. what the responses were to that. Um, it actually it wasn't so many as what uh, I what we thought it was what it was so. I think we, we don't want to be seen as overly puritanical or anything no. that we're trying to drive this underground or anything because that would make it even worse. No, and it's not our job to do that, but um, it is our job to, to ask the questions and it is our job to, to to as best we can protect people here in Northern Ireland and um, you know. Uh, we, I, I know certainly coming from a health service background, I've seen the effects that this, this has had on people. It's a so, issue. yeah, it is a public health issue as well. But no, I think we we have to um, just take all the sure. evidence on board and and get on with it, Johnny. Just before you come in, Fra had sure, um, said he wanted to say a, something. A point that uh, Mark had raised, and uh, and all of us have went through this uh, debate before. Uh, but uh, there's huge amounts of illegal gambling goes on, yeah. and uh, you, it's finding that happy medium. 
uh, that I sit on it. I think he said it was almost total support for the Sunday Open. And I think, and, uh, and again, uh, and uh, that's probably to deal with uh, some of the illegal gambling mm -hmm. goes on. And it's, this, it's a, probably the same with casinos. You know that uh, 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 it's getting that lane there that uh, that offers protection, but doesn't force it underground. Uh, that could be, in the end of the day, much much worse than what what's our present. As long as we can regulate it. No, you're absolutely right, Johnny. Yeah, sure. It's it's just you know, and it's on the back of Mark, Mark's point, and I've no doubt that there is people that will have. Uh, filled in this consultation and they're genuinely are independent but I suppose probably it's so out of sync with what probably many of us face on a day-to-day -day basis whether that's from a health perspective or indeed in a community perspective and I, I don't know how, how it can be achieved but we really need to identify a way of gaining independent extensive research um, that, that, that we can be more sure for example of, of its independent nature because um, the last thing we want here is for the consultation responses and the evidence that's given in informing uh, this piece of legislation uh, to be skewed in any one way uh, and I, th I think the committee really need to try and dig into that as to the type of, of, of consultation we're receiving it's, ju it's just a point uh, I, I don't know We've lost you, Johnny. You've stopped. Your volume has gone. Sorry, sorry. Surely through independent uh, research, uh, you know, whether that's through an outside company or whatever, you know, something like that and street service would pretend, potentially give us much more of a um, fair, balanced viewpoint. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to be overly critical of what we have because, again, there is some that's, that is, that is no doubt genuine, but we can't help but feel there must be motive behind some of the respondents. Well, we, I mean, we just have to take whatever we get presented with at face value when it comes to consultations, and it's up to people out there. Uh, I mean, we all know, we know ourselves when we see certain consultations that go out, we'll encourage people and we'll say, oh, we're doing a consultation on bedroom tax, say. So we'll go and we'll actively encourage people to respond to that. Um, so you can understand to a degree why people are encouraged to respond to whatever con whatever that consultation might be. Um, so, but I, I mean, we will, we will have the bill in front of us whenever that time comes. We will have other people will come in and brief us and will give us a different set of findings to what the department have come up with. And that's all part of our role as an MLA. So that, that's, you know, we'll take whatever evidence comes our way and we'll decide based on the evidence um, rather than any preconceptions that what any of us might have. Is that okay, members? AOB in this committee always opens up a whole discussion. <laughs> so yeah, so sorry, say, Janice, go ahead. We build a, we'll build in a session into next week meeting to have a discussion around some of the key areas, and then we'll bring a draft report back the week after to yeah. the committee. <coughs> Go to the yeah. Is that okay? Members yeah. agreed with that? Agreed. Yeah, okay, so can I move on from AOB if there's nothing else? Johnny seems to have left us, he's dropped off there. Um, I'm going to move on then to item agenda number 11, which is date, time and location of next meeting. Um, just to advise you that the next meeting is due to take place here at 2 pm, room 29, next Wednesday. Um, and after the meeting on the 30th of September, committee meetings then will revert back to our Thursday morning. So the first one back for Thursday morning will be the 8th of October, but next week we're here. It's a Wednesday and we're in this room. Can I thank members for their advice and their attendance today? Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. From the Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.